another very another small announcement, um, which is that. So that's speaking for Sam and Jason and myself. Um, we are all very grateful to our uh, math department secretaries, Lynn and Anne, uh, for actually doing all the work in organizing this Agnes. You know, setting up the hotel reservations and setting up the banquet and dealing with everything. Um, it seems that they're too shy to stand here and be applauded, but let's applaud them in absence. <laughs> Okay, uh, yeah, and so then um, the, last, the last talk for this, for this Agnes meeting is um, by Julia Hartman from the University of Pennsylvania, and I have to read her title because it's long. It's Local Global Principles for Homogeneous Spaces over Arithmetic Function Fields. Thank you for the introduction and uh, for the invitation to speak here. It's a pleasure and an honor. And uh, now that we've thanked the staff, of course, we need to thank the organizers of this wonderful conference. I unfortunately had to miss part of it because I was a little bit sick earlier this week. But I'm sure you all had a wonderful time in this nice location. So let's, let's thank them all. <laughs> and, and while we're there, um, I'm, I'm going to move up from a speaker to an organizer next time. We're going to have the next Agnes at 10. So in the fall, and tentative dates are October 13 to 15. So we just sort of half nailed them down this week. We still have to iron out a few things. It might still change. But generally, in that it should be in October, so this, uh, this is going to be <coughs> the next meeting. And I think that's all the announcements I'm supposed to make. So um, let me write down at least a short version of my long title. I'm going to be telling you about local global principles for homogeneous spaces. And I'm going to skip the over arithmetic function fields and writing it down. And this is joint work with Jean Louis Colliotelin David Harbiter, Danny Krashen, and also Harmala and Suresh. So this falls into the area of arithmetic geometry. And we're trying to study um, rational points on things. And we're doing that by looking at what is called local global principles. So over non-algebraically closed fields, you have a variety. You don't even know, does it have any rational points? If it does have rational points, are they dense or are they not dense? Um, and so one important tool in there has been the use of local global principles. So x over some field f, f is a field, some variety. <laughs> And omega is a set of places of f. And then for each element, we have the completion at that place. And the question is, um, <clears throat> so if we have points everywhere locally, Does that imply that we globally have a rational point? And so <clears throat> in general, the answer is no. Uh, but it's yes in some nice cases. So for example, for things like severi bra varieties or um, quadric hypersurfaces. And the reason is that there's usually a bit more structure around. And the structure is given by the symmetries of a group, symmetries coming from a group. So we are going to be looking at um, homogeneous spaces. <coughs> under an algebraic group. So we have an action. And we want that to be transitive. And the crucial key case here is when you have this action such that the map that you get 
from x cross g to x cross x by on points sending x to uh, to, to x and g to the pair x comma x g. Um, so comparing the point with its image under the group action, if that is an isomorphism. So that means the action is not just transitive, but it's also simply transitive. You only can go from one element to another element in a unique way. And so these are called g torsors. Or principal homogeneous spaces, but that's much longer. So I'm going to stick with the G torsions. And so this is base field F around, over which everything has been defined. And um, <coughs> I, I found, I have to read this because I'm not very good at memorizing quotes. I found a quote from um, Weil in 1954. He said, the pair consisting of such a space and a point on it does not materially differ from the group. Thus, there is little incentive for studying these spaces as long as one is not paying attention to the ground field or if the ground field is algebraically closed. Right? So even though this is sort of, sort of the most yes, no, black and white situation where either this thing is, has no points, or if it has a point, well, then it's isomorphic to the group as a G space that's completely understood and is, we call it trivial. Okay? So <coughs> um, even though that's the, this sort of black and white case, it really does, in a lot of cases, give you general information about more general homogeneous spaces. So one of the nice facts about here is that if you have the set of G-torsors over F up to isomorphism, then um, this is in one-to-one -one correspondence to the set of one co-cycles of um, <coughs> the Gower group of the separable closure to G of FS modulo equivalence. And this we talked a little bit about in the pre talk. And um, this is what I'm just going to abbreviate as H1 FG as a standard abbreviation. So we're assuming G is smooth. Mm -hmm. Sorry to be yes. technical. Okay. Yes. 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 Um, And I'm over a field, so um, anyway. So this is not a uh, group; it's a pointed set. And here we have the trivial call cycle, um, which sends everything to one, and that corresponds to the what we call the trivial torsor, which is the isomorphism class. of G itself as a G torsor, and that, remember, corresponded to having a rational point. So instead of looking for rational points, I can say, uh, I look at the corresponding co-cycle, is it trivial, or is it in the class of the trivial co-cycle? And I'm looking at local global principles, so um, I want to not just look over my field F that I was at, but I want to look at extensions. Well, if I have a field extension, then I have a restriction map from the absolute Gauer group of E to the absolute Gauer group of F, and so I get a map that goes H1FG to H1EG. Right? This looks like it's going in the wrong direction, but that's because this is really the Gawa group of F, Gawa group of E. And um, <coughs> so this means that my local global principle holds exactly when, well, I can take uh, this homology, and I can map it to all the different local ones. And I can ask, what are the elements here that map to the trivial co-cycle here everywhere? And we'll call that the kernel of the map, even though it's not a homomorphism, but it's a map point it sets. So the kernel is just a pre-image of one. Uh, so if and only if this is trivial. Right. But of course, I already told you it's in general not trivial. So uh, then we're going to want to study what it is.
So we're going to give it a name. This is called the K-Chaparevich set. It is uh, a group if G is um, commutative. Okay, then these cohomology groups are groups. And um, I'm sure you've heard about it. Uh, you know, in the case when um, G is an elliptic curve, that's a very important studied object. And if you can study it really well, you can win a million dollars. So, <coughs> okay. Um, some results about this. Over what we call global fields. So these are either number fields or function fields over finite fields. So the first thing is that um, it's a result due to Knieser, Harder, and Chernusov. Um, that says that if G is semi-simple, simply connected, so that's some condition on the group, um, then this obstruction set actually vanishes. Then there's a result due to Sarah and Chernusov. That says that in the case of a number field, if you have a connected group and it's rational, meaning as a variety, then the obstruction also vanishes. And then there's a result that just in general tells you how bad it can get. And the number field case is fairly old. Uh, due to Borel and Sarah, and the function field case is due to Brian Conrad, and I believe it was about 10 years ago, so not that old. Um, <coughs> that in any event, this obstruction set is always finite. So it doesn't get that bad. So I started in the middle, so I still have a lot of boards left over here, so that's good. Okay, so the fields that we're going to study this over are of a somewhat different character, and I call them semi-global fields, and you'll see why in a minute. So that was the story over global fields over there, and semi-global fields are sort of maybe the next step or some next step. And <clears throat> why are semi-global fields good for this? Well, they have some underlying geometry, and there's loads and loads of collections of overfields that you can study uh, with respect which, to which you can study these local global principles. If you look at a local global principle sort of from an abstract point of view, all you did is you took a field and a bunch of overfields. And you know, yes, classically, they, they come from some completions, but maybe you could study different sets of overfields. Right? And these semi-global uh, fields allow various uh, such um, collections of overfields that are motivated by geometry. They are also studied by other people. Um, if you, for example, if you are studying sort of uh, curves over curves, and then you're looking at sort of like a surface fiber over a curve, you're looking at a point on the base, looking at the complete local ring there, and you're somehow looking at the fiber over that, then you're going to end up with a field like this. And um, so, but for us, uh, we're studying them because, well, okay, so because, you know, they, they have nice properties, but also because there's this hope that, I haven't told you what a semi-global field is yet, but one example is something like QP of X. And there's a hope that if you could understand QP of X really well for all P, then maybe you could understand Q of X. So in that sense, it's semi-global. Okay, so K is a complete discretely valued field from now on. And <clears throat> OK, that's its valuation ring. And then we'll have a uniformizer T, a residue field little k, 
And then we're going to take a function field in one variable. So the function field of a curve. So these complete discretely valued fields come in two different flavors. Um, and so you should think of the following two example cases. So k could be something like qp. Okay, in that case, would be dp. The uniformizer would be t. Uh, the residue field would be fp. And then f could be something like qp of x. Right? This f is going to be our semi-global field. Um, the other example is you take a completely discretely valued field of a different flavor, namely you start with some field k, which will be your residue field later, and you take a Laurent series over that in a variable. And then the power series will be <coughs> your evaluation ring. t is just t, k is k, and this can be arbitrary. And f would be little k. Okay, so why is this called semi-global? Well, there are different reasons for it, but one reason <coughs> is, let's look at this last example, ah, yeah. And this example case is sort of slightly easier to understand. So for most of what I'm going to say, in, at least in, uh, in explicit cases, I'll, I'll stick with that equal characteristic situation. <coughs> but that's just, um, that's not, not necessary. So let's let that be a rational function field. Oh, did I? Yeah. Function field over um, a Laurent series field over some field. So what we would like to do is this f is the function field. of some projective curve. And we want to take a nice model. Which is just defined over the valuation rate. And <coughs> then we will also look at its closed fiber, which is the base change to the residue field. So here's the example. <coughs> if you have a rational function field, so that's just P1, a copy of P1. In there, you have the closed fiber over the residue field. The residue field is little k. And so you can sort of see why this could be called semi-global, because it's kind of global in the x direction, but it's local in the t direction, because you're just thinking of it as an infinitesimal thickening of this, um, this line, uh, the closed fiber. <coughs> So that's why it's called semi-global. Now, if you take a point P and X, then we're going to define associated rings and fields. So our P hat is going to be the complete local ring. <coughs> and then I'm going to let FP be its fraction field. So I've associated. Um, a ring and a fraction and a field. So how are you supposed to think about this? Well, let's do an example here. We could take the point x equals t equals 0. <coughs> and then fp, what will we get? Well, we'd just be getting the fraction field of power series in two variables x and t, because we've now made the x variable local as well. Before, we had the t variable being local. Now we're making them both. Um, and then the standard notation for that seems to be this, which is not the same as iterated Laurent series. Okay? Like for power series, it doesn't matter whether you write brackets um, like this or whether you write two sets of brackets around t and x separately. But for um, Laurent series, it does matter a lot. So this is just a, this is just a short annotation. <coughs> OK. Um, so think of that as some little kind of thickening of the point. So 
So what do we get? Well, already we have a collection of overfields, right? And that's why I didn't stop at the rings, because I wanted a collection of overfields so I can study my local global principle. So I have a collection of overfields now. Namely, I can take all these p's for points in the closed fiber. So, uh, okay, whenever I have a collection of overfields, I'm going to do the following. I'm going to look at the corresponding local global principle. And I'm going to study its kernel. And to study its kernel, I'm going to give it a name. And I'm going to call that Sha X of F, at least, because it's somehow dependent on this model, or more precisely on its closed fiber. But that's fine. <coughs> so this is already one more collection of overflow. But in the pre-talk, I told people about what are called patches. And that's what really makes the stuff that we do work, namely that we don't have to work with all the points on the closed fiber, but we're sort of trying to combine a lot of the points where nothing happens into open subsets. So that's what we're going to do. So <coughs> we're going to let P, script P, be a non-empty finite subset of the closed fiber. And I'm going to say containing all interesting points of X. For example, if you have different components, then you want to take the points where they meet, for example. And you have to have a point on each component and, and things like that. So, um, but they're all the interesting points. And the rest gives me a set of components of the complement. Now I need to somehow smash together all the FPs for the Ps that were in one of these subsets that were uninteresting uh, into something. And the way that this works is that if you have an element U in this uh, set U, you let RU hat be the T added completion of what you get when you look at the elements <coughs> in the function field that are regular along you. And then you let um, uh, F u, as usual, be the fraction field of that. So there's always an underlying ring, and then there's always a fraction field of that. So OK, so let's see if we can um, see what that would look like. So for example, um, I took out a different point now at my projective line. I took out the point at infinity. It doesn't really matter. <coughs> I just don't like writing too many inverses. So what's this fu? Well, we'd be taking, sort of for this r u hat, we'd be taking something like the limit of uh, k bracket x t mod t to the n for various n. And so what you get is actually for r u hat, you get k bracket x double bracket t, oops, and then for f u, you get the fraction field of that. <clears throat> How are you supposed to think of it? Well, this was our model of p1. And you're supposed to think of it as, so you're mis clearly missing the point of infinity on the closed fiber, but you're sort of pinching down to that point. And that's because certain things um, that you wouldn't expect are, are now invertible. Like, so for example, 1 minus xt is a unit there. And so it doesn't have a locus on it. OK. So now we get a new collection of overfields, right? We now are just taking the fps for the interesting points. And we're taking those fus. And then we can study the local global principle with respect to that. So we go from H1 FG to the product 
over all these P's and U's. And we study its kernel. And we give it a name. And it depends on that set P that I picked, so it's going to be called Sha FP. Uh, Sha P of FG. And in fact, that's not just a single uh, collection of overfields. Like in this example, it's infinitely many because I can take different choices for the set P. I said it had to contain all the interesting points, but I can make it bigger. Um, and I can do get, so I can get loads and loads of these collections of overfields. Now, it wouldn't be good if I just decided to study some objects that have nothing to do with the objects other people study, right? I mean, you can do that for a while, but it's not a good idea in general. So, even if you already have five other people that care about this because they're your co-authors, <laughs> but, um, but the fact is that we had this original tate schaffer rich set, right? We can do that for this field, too, where we take the, 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 uh, the discrete, all the discrete valuations, in this case, and the, um, and the completions. So those are all those places. And <clears throat> then we had this abstraction set that came from points on the closed fiber. And then we had this abstraction set that came from our patches. And the fact is that they're all related. So I can't even hope for this abstraction to vanish, meaning for my local global principle to hold, if these abstractions don't also vanish. Now, that would only give me negative results. That would still not be so great, although maybe that'd be something. But um, <clears throat> the point is, well, OK, let me first say this. This one, this inclusion is well understood. Basically, in good situations, meaning if you have a reasonably nice curve, then this is going to be some kind of limit over all of these as you vary the set of P. So if you understand all of these, you understand this one, basically. This one is what we want, right? Because this is what we want to study. Um, and this one is an equality in interesting cases, I'm going to say. So it's not always. Uh, whereas we or actually we don't know <coughs> exactly when, but in some cases we can show it's inequality. So that means we can actually say something about this obstruction set by looking at this obstruction set. And what's nice about this obstruction set is this is often tractable. Why? Well, even though I have infinitely many of those, um, if you look at the collection of overfields that I'm taking, that is suddenly a finite collection. Right? So why is this easier? Oh, so one is that this collection that we're looking at is a finite collection of overfields. <clears throat> and the other is that there's something else going on, namely that you can compare the local information. And I'll let you know what I mean by that uh, first, maybe in an example. So if you have a point P that's on the closure of some of my sets U, meaning one of these points that I took out, right? It's got a be on the closure of one of these uh, oh, um, opens, then, so you have F, you have FP, you have FU, they're both overfields of F, but they actually are contained in a common overfield, which I'm going to call F beta. And this is supposed to be reminding you of a branch <coughs> at P on U. And so let's see what that field looks like. Yeah, so now I regret taking out the point at infinity, so maybe I want to take out the point at zero. If I'd done the same thing, uh, I would have gotten something that was pinched down at zero. Here I had my little neighborhood of the points, 
And so there's going to be some overlap here, right? Which is tiny, but that's, that's sort of what I'm trying to describe geometrically. <coughs> so in our, in our case, this would be, in our example, this would actually be the iterated Laurent series field. Well, first x, actually. Because these things are always chaotically complete. So, <coughs> so this is iterated Laurent series. So now, what is this actually um, formally? So again, there's an underlying ring, R beta hat. So what is this? This is the beta at completion of the localization of RP hat at uh, beta. And <coughs> F beta is this fraction here, as in the result. What's beta here? If I'm localizing, completing, beta is a height one prime in this ring containing t. So over t. <coughs> so think of it as a branch. OK, so the difference is that we have a finite collection and we can somehow compare this information. Is Just it making a lot of noise? Eyes, yeah. Causing some noise, so maybe put it at the center. Or something. Yeah. Hmm. That's gonna work. No, no, I'm gonna do that myself. Sorry. I think it's just bouncing around. All right. Okay. <clears throat> so, how do we compare this local uh, this local information? So here's a theorem. <coughs> so we have our group G. We have our overfields FU and FP. And we can do that for all of them. And we can map that to the product over all the g's of the f branches. So how do we do that? Well, so here an element just maps diagonally. And here, we can map that to the collection of gp inverse du, where this goes into f beta if p is a, uh, beta is a branch at p on u. <coughs> then we can do the same thing on the level of homology. And we can compare those things over here, but I don't even need to write that down because that's not so relevant for what I'm about to do. But the main thing is that this um, actually so. gives an exact sequence. So there's a connecting map between H0 and H1 which is what you would like. So it's some, somehow a little bit like a meyer torus sequence. Um, <clears throat> why is this good? Well, we wanted to study the kernel of this map, right? That's, that's the kernel of that map. That gives us immediately a description of that. Well, all the things that are in the kernel here are the things that I somehow had here that I couldn't factor, right? So this gives me a description of my obstruction <coughs> as a double cosine. People who work with algebraic groups like double cosine descriptions. They're very useful and very classical. So this is good. This is good news. OK. Let, let's see how good this news is and what we can do with it. A 
And let's put ourselves in the baby case where our G is actually a finite constant group, right? That's sort of a, usually the example that algebraic groups people try to avoid, but it doesn't matter. Um, and let's look at example situations of what our collections of overfields might look like. Right, we already had that example where x is p1. Um, and we had our closed fiber x. We took, a po took out some point. So what does the collection of overfields look like? Well, we have one fp and one fu, and we have one branch. Nice. OK. Now let's see if we had a finite group. And somebody hands you an element here, and you're supposed to factor it. It's a if it's a finite constant group and it was defined over f, then you actually have no work to do. Right? You don't need to factor. You just make one of the factors the factor, and you make the other factor one. OK? But it might not always be so nice. <coughs> so you could, for, for example, have an x where uh, the closed fiber is a nodal curve. And remember, you had to take out all the interesting points, so you have to work with this point. Now you still have one p and one u, but you now have two branches because somehow right, this p lies on u in two different ways. So what you're going to get, I didn't leave enough space here, is again you're going to get one fp, one fu, but you're going to get two branches, which I'm going to call beta 1 and beta 2. And what does it now mean to factor, let's say you had a finite constant group again, right? Now I'm handing you two elements, this one and this one, and you're trying to factor it. And in general, it won't work. I mean, if I give you nice elements, it might work. But if I don't give you nice elements, it won't work. And why? Well, you can start factoring this one somehow. But then this fp embeds into this other branch field in a different way. And you're going to be stuck with what you picked here. And if it doesn't match that, well, then you're going to have to adjust it with this. But then you messed up what you did in the first part. So the problem is that this graph has a loop. And that's why it doesn't work. So what we're going to study is a little bit of a simplified version of what the closed fiber looks like. And that's called the reduction graph. So in this case, it'll have a p and a u and a beta. And in this case, it'll have a p, a u, and a beta 1, and a beta 2. So this is called the reduction graph. And I'm going to use gamma for that. So what we've now gotten is we've gotten ourselves from our field F to our model, and then from that to a finite collection of overfields plus a graph that somehow um, encodes the geometry of the closed fiber. So no, I mean the fiber, the closed fiber could be could have several components. Um, then you have to take points where components meet. Um, yeah, and you have to take so you have to you have to take nodal points. You have to take points where components meet, and you have to have one point at least on each component. That's what you have to do. <coughs> okay, so. In the case of a finite constant group, we just convinced ourselves that loops are trouble, right? And it turns out that that's most of the trouble. <coughs> so if you have a group that's rational, by what I mean, that G0 is rational, and the group of components is constant, then we can give an explicit description of this SHA, which is this double cosine. And what does it look like? Well, it's going to be homomorphisms from the fundamental group of this reduction graph. Modulo conjugation, simultaneous conjugation. 
don't worry about this modulo. We are interested in when is this thing trivial, right? So, yes. This one? Yeah. Um, when is this thing trivial? Right? We're mapping from the fundamental group of a graph to a finite group. Finite constant group, like an honest to goodness finite group. The fundamental of a gra group of a graph is a free group. And the number of generators is related to the number of loops in there. And so when is this going to be trivial? Well, it's not going to be trivial after mod modding up by conjugation if this wasn't already trivial. So um, it's going to be trivial either when this group is trivial or when this group is trivial. Because otherwise, you always have from the free, a non-trivial free group to a finite group, you always have something, right? So in particular, uh, this is trivial. So <clears throat> if and only if, we, well, either G is connected or gamma doesn't have any loops. So means it's a tree. All right, this um, huh, is still there, right? This is the analog of the theorem there in the number field case, right? G is, G is connected rational, chi is trivial. Well, this is not the same chi yet, but anyway, at least this patching chi is trivial. So this is uh, similar to number field case. Okay, then we wanted to understand what happens if the group is not rational, right? What can you do? What can you say in general? And we looked for a very, very, very long time for counterexamples, and eventually Collier-Tillin and Parmelin and Suresh found one uh, where the group is a non-rational torus. Collier-Tillin always said if there's a counterexample, it has to be a torus. So he was right. So there was a torus, a non-rational torus, where there's a counterexample. Um, on the other hand, rational isn't the end of the story. Like Danny, for example, had proved a result that if you retract rational, then that's still fine. So there's got to be something um, that is more general than that. And we still don't have a complete answer, but we're trying to get closer to other cases, see other cases where um, this, uh, this obstruction set vanishes, but also understand you know, when it doesn't vanish. And, in particular, understand what about the analogs of these other theorems that are known for number theory. So now we're going to assume for our, so you know we we're trying to see can we can we do a bit better than that? Can we get does this description come from something more general? Um, and how bad can things get? And and let me say the the proof here is actually. Uh, is basically, well, you have to show that if you're rational, you can factor using that, you know, from the double coset description, that's what it means. And you can do that very explicitly using that the thing is rational. You can somehow um, map it to some affine space and, and kind of decompose things there. And because you're complete, you really only have to do it modulo t to the n for all powers of n. And if you do something modulo t multiplicatively, that's really doing it additively. And that, that's what's making it easy. And, and the other part about the, when it's not connected, it's exactly that argument that we just went through in the example. So there's not really that much more to it. A little bit, but. <clears throat> OK, now we're going to assume for simplicity um, that the characteristic of the residue field is 0. Because uh, otherwise, you have to say things about bad primes and good primes. And I'm going to not do that here. And we're going to assume that we have a group that's now not just defined over f, but actually over the valuation ring of k and is reductive there. So in that case, we know that this is one of these cases where we know that the shots are the same. So uh, I think there's still that sequence up there, right? I'm trying to get onto the right-hand side. Um, the middle one is actually the same in that case. And the middle one is cooked up out of all the left ones. So um, that means when I understand something, that should give me um, something for the, for the real shot that we're interested in. <clears throat> so here's a theorem that we proved. So this is now with all six authors. 
uh, assume that gamma is a geometric tree. And what I mean by that is that if you do base changes to um, extensions of your field, um, then, then you look at the reduction graph of the corresponding closed fiber that you get, you still get a tree. <coughs> so it's some stability condition. And this is for some model and some set on it. Then if you have a collection of elements on these branch fields, <coughs> then there exist collections GP and GU. Remember, ideally, we would like to factor these elements. But we can't quite do that yet. Um, but what we were able to show is that you can do, right? Ideally, you would like GP times G beta times GU to be 1. That, that would mean that you factored this one as a product of this and this, or the inverses. But we can do that such that this is now integral. So remember, this F beta was the branch field, but there was an underlying ring for each of them. So we can make that integral. And better yet, and it's congruent to the identity modulo whatever your uniformizer is. I'm just going to say T. Well, it's actually beta, but yeah. <coughs> So I, I forgot to say that when you have these branch fields, the nice thing about them is, well, they help you compare the local information. But the other nice thing is that these branch fields always complete discretely valued fields. And so this is the valuation ring of that field. So we couldn't quite factor it, but we could make it integral modulo these other two pieces, and such that it's congruent to the identity um, modulo beta. Now, what does that mean for us? Well, actually, let me first, um, well, OK. So the proof is, again, very, very similar to what we've seen before and very motivated by the geometry of the closed fiber because we're assuming that it's this, this tree, again. So let me say a couple of ingredients of what we're using. So the first thing is, um, <clears throat> so we're going to start with, so we have a tree. So a tree has a root, right? And then we go, go on from there, trying to achieve this sort of half factorization. And so if we just have something like this, so this is in our closed fiber, then in gamma, what does it look like? Well, it looks like this. And maybe these were now two different components, u1, u2, and this is p. So I've somehow arrived at this point. Um, well, I've arrived at one of these Remember, these, these are the branches. So this is, the, this is where I have information, where I have these elements that I'm supposed to be factoring. And um, the point is that um, one of these is closer to the root. right? So one of them I've already dealt with. The other one is further away from the root. And so I can just do this factorization in the same way that I did before. And the key ingredients here. That is, if G is anisotropic, meaning it doesn't have any uh, split subtori, then <coughs> we know that since it's a discrete, complete discretely valued ring, these two groups, the point groups, are actually the same over the field and over the valuation ring. And so that helps me make things integral. And then the other uh, is that. If you look at what happens if you calculate this beta, then that's going to be the same as taking rp hat mod p. 
So, uh, well, actually, also not beta. beta yeah, not beta. So that means that you can approximate elements that um, you got here from elements in this in the ring that came from uh, from your point. So this is how uh, how we use sort of this graph condition and the fact that we're working um, with these rings. <clears throat> now, what's the consequence of this? Remember we started out with a torsor, a principal homogeneous space. This is saying that if Z is a G torsor under all the hypothesis that we have uh, for, the, for the theorem, um, we were assuming that its class is an obstruction to the local global principle. This is telling us that it extends <coughs> to a torsor over the curve, which is trivial when reduced to the closed fiber, right? Because I made it integral, but I also um, factored it in such a way that modulo t is going to be um, the trivial torsor. And then there's a result of Gilles Parmel and Suresh that says that such torsors are trivial. And there's a risky topology. So under the above hypothesis, this shot actually vanishes. So in characteristic zero, which I said I was assuming, so okay, let me just write down use this result of GL Parmala. Now, in characteristic zero, once you have reductive groups, you get everything because you know there's a structure theory, and you know what the unipotent radical does, and it, in the cohomology, that that somehow doesn't cause any trouble. So you get actually in characteristic zero, don't need that the group is reductive. <clears throat> but what if gamma is not a tree, right? So that was the other situation. Can we say something that's reminiscent of this? And um, there's one last thing that I want to mention here. So under certain hypotheses, I don't want to, on, on, the, on the graph, <clears throat> we don't have this very generally yet, unfortunately, but we get that this obstruction set is the same as this one and comes from a description that looks almost the same as over there, um, except that here, instead of the um, group of components, you need to take the, what's called the R equivalence classes. And that's over the residue field. And R equivalence um, is, is, a, is something that studies how far away you are from, from being rational. And in, in the case that uh, we were a rational group in this definition, that would exactly be this, actually. So uh, this is a, a notion, that's a geometric notion introduced by Manin, I believe. But um, <coughs> yeah, it, it, it lets you describe how far you are from being rational. Uh, yeah, and that, unfortunately, can be non-trivial, a set of R equivalence classes. And it can also be infinite. And so while we would like to have positive versions of these results, we actually have the opposite. This can be not equal to 1. And in fact, I mean, we knew that it couldn't be. There were examples, but it can be non-trivial even when G is semi-simple, simply connected, and worse, it can be infinite even for G 
this is sort of the nicest type of group that you could expect. So this is very different from the case of global fields and number fields. And um, there's, there's lots more, more to study there. Um, we don't know how high you have to go with the cohomological dimension of the field, for example. Um, our fields have cohomological dimension at least four. Uh, there is a conjecture that you know, if you have low cohomological dimension, then maybe you still get, for semi-simple, simply connected groups, you still get local global principal holes. But, um, but we don't know that yet. OK, I thank you for your attention. And again, let's thank the organizers for this wonderful conference. Yeah, so, so I mean, I, I at some point, I think I forgot to do, to do that, but at some point I switched from algebraic groups to linear algebraic groups, and that's what these theorems are for. I should have, yeah. and so then, then they're actually always finite. Um, and yeah, it would be nice to study um, Abelian variety. So yeah. And I vaguely also remember there's this question that comes up from time to time whether you can split these things with cyclic field extensions. You mean split the maximal torus with a cyclic? Yeah, just make the torso, tri trivialize the torsor. Oh, trivialize the torsor. Okay, that, I don't, I don't know. Some thought they could prove that, but then not quite. I, I don't know, but I'll ask them. So thank you again.